So just um, so uh, Sybil Schaefer is from UC San Diego, and she's going to be talking to us about facing climate realities, digital curation, and climate change. Um, if you have questions for Sybil, please put those in the chat um, as they come to you, and then um, those will be uh, compiled and um, and then uh, brought together for the question and answers uh, near the end of the session today. So thank you and uh, welcome, Sybil. Thank you, Kari. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, so a brief outline of my talk, I divided it into chapters just because it that seemed like the natural division. So we're going to start by talking about energy dependency, move into climate change where there's going to be a breakout room, um, then into digital preservation and climate change. And then chapter four is moving forward with another breakout room. And then finally at the end is the Q&A. So let me just uh, move the videos so I can see my notes. So I gave a talk this past summer where I mentioned that this past July, the temperatures were more than four standard deviations above the 1979 to 2000 mean. Also that month, the TSA screened a record number of passengers, global oil demand surpassed its previous peak, and global coal production was repeated, uh, reported reaching a record high. The takeaway was that in addition to temperatures increasing, we are also increasing our fossil fuel emissions. This gave me pause. If we aren't reducing our emissions quickly enough, we will experience the worst effects of climate change, and those effects will make digital curation a low priority. So I started researching climate change with two questions in mind. How bad will it get, and what's the timeline that we're working with? And it was then that I started to fall into a rabbit hole. Um, if, you, if you're feeling particularly sensitive today and don't wanna think about some of the pretty drastic things that climate change has in store for us, then this might be a good time to step away from this talk. Please do prioritize your mental health. Um, sometimes it's like not even easy for me to talk about, so you might see me getting emotional too. Um, because as I dug into climate change and the reasons why we haven't protected the one habitable place in the universe, I realized that the entire way we've constructed our modern industrial civilization is akin to a house of cards. Our economic systems, our political systems, our technology, our agriculture are all based on system a system of energy extraction that is not actually founded on the real world limitations of our planet. Global warming and climate change are symptoms, not the cause. Before I get into things, I want to clarify the purpose of this presentation. It's not to scare you all or promote despondencies, although those are very valid reactions. My hope is that by facing and acknowledging what the future holds for us, we can prepare for it in healthy and adaptive ways. So I think resilience and adaptations to the challenges before us that we may be successful at intentionally preserving materials for future generations. <laughs> I also want to present a more full understanding of how our digital preservation activities require extraction of resources from under the Earth's crust and how that extraction pollutes the environment, especially that in the global south, which benefits the least from extraction. We can't truly understand global warming and all of its complexities without taking a systems approach. This type of approach is sorely lacking in our field, which is highly specialized. We narrow in to such details as capturing every single bit on a floppy disk, but we don't discuss the economic conditions in place that allowed floppy disks to be invented or to subsequently become obsolete. We also very rarely discuss the oil, metals, and minerals need to create, needed to create the storage we use, nor how these extractive processes practices create unsafe working conditions in toxic landfills. To start to see things from a systems view and understand the risks we face, we first have to understand how we got here. 10,000 years after the agricultural revolution, humans discovered how to extract fossil energy from the earth. Before this time, humans were predominantly limited to the energy their bodies or beasts of burden could provide. This represented a huge amount of new and cheap energy available to humans. The only cost to us was the cost of extracting these materials from the earth's core. The sun, through a process that occurs over millennia, had done us the favor of storing a dense amount of energy into coal. 
We could use this energy source to power machines. And it was through releasing carbon into the atmosphere that we were able to industrialize our society. As humans replaced manual tasks with machines, our economic growth quadrupled from the era of agriculture where it had remained relatively stable from generation to generation. Our population also started its exponential trend, increasing from 600 million in 1700 to almost 1 billion in 1800. And this is a, a picture of a steam train. The discovery of oil in the latter half of the 20th century accelerated the human economy's growth rate again. Oil provides higher energy density than coal, is easier and less expensive to transport, and requires less human labor than coal to extract. When you combine the energy density of oil with the power of a machine, you exponentially increase production. A gallon of gasoline can output the same work in a few minutes as a person laboring for an entire month. By the late 20th century, 85% of all energy used by humankind would come from fossil fuels. This is a black and white photo of an oil well. To put humanity's use of fossil fuels into context, Buckminster Fuller coined the term energy slaves. In a 1940 article in, a, in Fortune magazine, he calculated the yield of an energy slave by taking the energy from minerals and water consumed by an industry and dividing it by the energy provided by a human being, approximately 2,000 kilojoules per eight hour day. One energy slave represents one unit of human labor. Global fossil fuel use is equivalent to at least 800 billion humans working for eight hours a day, equating to essentially 100 energy slaves per person on Earth. But because Earth's resources aren't distributed equitably, the average American has 300 energy slaves working for them, while the average Haitian only has one. This also means that our economy is powered by an additional 800 billion energy slaves. And it's not lightly that the term slaves is used. In his book, Energy of Slaves, Oil and the New Servitude, Andrew Nicky Forek argues how it was the replacement of fossil fuel energy for human energy, which allowed us to outlaw slavery. So what does this mean? In addition to providing an easy to grasp metaphor of the energetic value oil provides humanity, energy slaves can be used to understand energy return on energy invested, or EROEI, which is also known as net energy. Net energy is the amount of energy required to extract oil compared to the amount of energy that it can provide. In the early 1900s, one oil energy slave could drill an oil well and discover another 100 energy slaves, or 100 to 1, to replace himself with. Today, the ratio has slipped closer to 10 to 1, or one study even pegged it at 6 to 1, which brings it closer to the level of renewable energy technologies. Martin King Hubbard is credited for creating the term peak oil, or the time when the maximum rate of global oil production will occur, after which oil production will begin an irreversible decline. Today, the oil that is easiest to extract, or conventional oil, is already gone. The oil we extract now is colloquially called tight oil and can be found in the Permian oil fields in Texas. You may have heard that the U.S. increased our oil production last year. Most of that oil came from these Permian fields. This increase is possible due to technology, which has essentially provided us with a bigger straw to slurp up the oil faster than we could in the past. Barring any new oil field discoveries, we could be looking at 10 to 15 more years of oil production. It's not that there's not any oil left, it's just too energy intensive to be worth extracting. The net energy is too low. On any given day, the human race consumes about 100 million barrels of crude oil. This is a graph of fossil fuel use through time. This graph really underscores how unusual of a time we are living in and how large this burst of ancient energy is. A world powered by fossil fuels is all we have ever known, so it seems quite normal to us. All of our infrastructure and all of our built world is based on burning fossil fuels, and it's difficult to imagine the future being any different. Energy, specifically cheap oil, has allowed us to grow our economy and our, ex and our population exponentially. As oil prices rose, globalism and outsourcing our goods manufacturing to countries in the global south allowed us to continue living our extravagant lives at low inflation rates. 
Since the first use of fossil fuel energy, our global population has increased five times, our energy usage has increased 18 times, and our economy has grown by 80 times. Countries that use the most oil have the highest gross domestic product. Countries that have cons consistent energy grids also have higher GDP. As American economist Julian Simon states, energy is the master resource. You may be thinking, sweet, if oil is too expensive to extract, it will stay in the ground and not be burned up into the atmosphere. That's true, but the reduction of available cheap fossil fuels, especially within such a short time frame, has significant consequences for our economy and our ability to shift to infrastructure that operates on capturing renewable energy, like wind and solar. So, quick lesson in economics. The US dollar is a fiat currency. It's not tied to any natural resources like gold. We are the ones who give money value because money is not tied to actual wealth like abundant forests or fisheries, thriving ecosystems, or an unpolluted biosphere. Money has become separated from the realities of a world in which there are finite resources. Let me unpack that a bit. We operate within a fractional reserve banking system where money is created when banks issue debt. Banks only need to keep a fraction of bank deposits on reserve to be available for withdrawal, hence the fractional reserve part of fractional reserve banking. And actually, in 2020, during COVID, the Federal Reserve lowered the fractional reserve requirement to zero. So when you deposit money in a TUA savings account, the bank turns around and loans it out, thereby increasing the amount of money in the overall economy. At the time of lending, the bank only creates the principal, not the interest. As a result, there's always more debt than money in existence. Banks issue debt because there's an expectation of future growth. Growth requires energy expenditure. Our economy is required to grow so that loans plus interest can be paid back. So what happens when there's not enough energy? The debt can't be paid. The Federal Reserve can inject money into the economy by buying up treasury bills like it did during COVID. This influx of money into the economy causes inflation, which we saw rise after the Fed bought up treasury bills. A continued influx of money into the economy causes hyperinflation. Hyperinflation begins to erode the trust society has in its financial system. Remember, we are the ones who agree that money has value. Money's value is a social agreement and not tied to actual physical resources. The first step in financial collapse is distrust in financial systems. So essentially, removing fossil fuels as our energy source or greatly restricting carbon emissions without a cheap energy replacement may crash our economy. This is one of the reasons why our political system has failed to effectively reduce carbon emissions. You can drastically reduce carbon emissions or you can have an exponentially growing economy, but you can't do both. We are also dependent on petroleum byproducts, not just for energy, but for a variety of products and processes that underpin our lives. Plastic is essential for packaging food and keeping it fresh as it is distributed through supply chains. Fossil fuels are also heavily used in agriculture to increase productivity through fertilizers. Polyester, which is made from petroleum byproducts, accounts for over half of the textiles produced. Medicine, actual medicines are used using petroleum byproducts and the medical supplies are heavily reliant on plastics. And our infrastructure, roads, concrete, steel, and building materials all require fossil fuel energy to be created. Oil is just one of the natural resources we have drastically reduced the supply of. Between 2030 and 2070, we will peak in the extraction of nearly all raw materials, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, and copper. Afterwards, they will increasingly become expensive to extract from the earth. This has critical implications for our ability to move to infrastructure based on capturing renewable energy sources. Wind turbines and solar panels need to be rebuilt over time. And the metals and minerals that we use in their manufacture are also becoming more scarce. Some of these metal, metals and minerals are also used in digital storage. In the future, as these resources become more scarce, we will, as a, we will, as a society, have to decide if we want to keep using them in our computer infrastructure, in our cell phones, etc., or if they are better used in providing us additional means of capturing energy. Taken from an 
Ecological perspective, the essential problem that we're facing is overshoot of the human population. From an ecological species view, we just did what species do when habitats present favorable conditions. We grew our population. Because of delayed feedback loops, the population increases beyond the carrying capacity of the environment. This means that environmental resources available to support the species become degraded or polluted. There are less that there are less available to support the larger population and population crashes ensue. Species go into overshoot whenever their conditions allow them to. Our use of fossil fuel energy has allowed us to increase the Earth's carrying capacity, but because Earth's resources are finite, we are also more quickly degrading it. Consumption of the Earth's resources is also not distributed equally. So a small amount of people in the global North are consuming much more than a large amount of people in the global South. In short, the energy provided by the burning of fossil fuels is what has allowed us to advance our technology and exponentially grow our economy as well as population. As the human population grew and more and more humans were freed up from providing the agricultural labor needed to feed the growing population, technology advanced and increased specialization of professional roles ushered in the age of computers. Our specialization, data curation, grew out of the need to manage the data generated by computers. As we've advanced, we've created stories around our advancements, which compare ourselves to pre-industrial civilizations and to nature. These myths shape how we see and interpret the world. These myths, like the myth of superabundance, allow us to pretend that energy will always be available, as will the other resources we mine from the earth to support our technologies. And if for some reason it's not, the myth of human progress leads us to believe that we'll find a technology that will solve our problems for us. We be we've believed in the myth that as humans, we are somehow above the natural world and exempt from its constraints due to our superior status and achievements, which have allowed us to grow exponentially in a few short centuries. What we miss when we believe these stories is that our advancements are solely based on our ability to harness the energy provided by fossil fuels and combine that energy with machines to create energy slaves. However, fossil fuels are not only a finite resource which are becoming more expensive to extract, but the burning of them has released so much carbon into the air that we are on a path to ensuring humanity's extinction. And constant progress leading to constant growth is ultimately unsustainable in a finite world. And that brings us to chapter two, climate change. And here we are, almost 20 slides in and we're finally getting into global warming. And apparently just in time because it's really heating up out there. When I first wrote my proposal for this conference, I noted that we were projected to hit 1.5 degrees Celsius warming above pre-industrial level by early next decade. That was before the, temp the headlines started rolling in about how last year was the hottest year on record. Although official intergovernmental panel on climate change or IPCC temperatures are averaged out over 20 years, there is growing consensus that we are in the realm of 1.5 degrees warming. Renowned climate scientist James Hansen, who delivered landmark testimony to Congress in the late 80s on the dangers of global warming, thus bringing that term to the public's attention for the first time, published an article last fall, which claims that we will exceed 1.5 degrees warming this decade and two degrees before 2050. The numbers from last year are particularly dire. The global temperature average was 1.48 degrees above pre-industrial level. Close to 50% of the days were more than 1.5 degrees warming and two days in November broke two degrees warming for the first time ever. These are all indications that global warming is happening faster than expected. The graph on the right shows this discontinuity, how instead of the warming temperatures moving in a linear fashion, there was a break and we jumped to an accelerated warming path. That last gra graph indicates an altering of our projected path really well, but I find this graph of the temperature since 1940 really illustrates just how much of an anomaly last year was. The red line represents last year, and you can see that it starts going significantly higher than any previous year starting in June. Part of the rise in this temperature is due to the effects of El Nino, which are known for temperature increases, and the El Nino did start right around then. However, this graph also includes the 29 other El Ninos that have happened since 1940, and none of them are even close. The white line in the left upper corner is uh, current 2024 temperatures. 
This is a chart of the daily sea surface temperature from 1981 to the present. About 30% of our carbon emissions are sucked up by the ocean. The result is that our oceans are drastically warmer than they were a few decades ago, and much warmer than even a year ago. The orange line represents 2023 temperatures. The black solid line on, in the top left of the chart is the 2024 temperatures to date. If you look at where the black line for this year ends and pick up where the orange line for last year begins, you'll notice that we've had and we've actually had an entire year of record-breaking ocean temperatures. Every day for the past year was a record-breaking day. So what happens when the world warms? Extra heat in the atmosphere causes increased sea levels, higher ocean temperatures, increased risk of wildfires, extreme and more frequent weather events and disasters, droughts and water scarcity, increased mortality, collapse of ecosystems and loss of biodiversity, disruption of food production and distribution, mass migration, disruption in global financial markets and economic contraction, and increase in conflict and political upheaval. According to the IPCC, every increment of global warming will intensify multiple and concurrent hazards. Climate change is also a common factor in the collapse of civilizations. And I haven't even discussed deforestation, albedo, or reflectivity loss, forever chemicals, topsoil erosion and depletion, fragile, fragile supply chains, microplastics, and increased vector-borne diseases. From an ecological standpoint, we know that we're in a state of overshoot or deficit. What does that mean in terms of the biocapacity of the planet? A group of researchers at the Stockholm Resilience Center have developed this planetary boundary model to help us visualize the areas in the biosphere that have been affected by our excess consumption and overuse of resources. One thing to note about this image is that climate change is only one boundary we've crossed. It also tracks water usage, land system changes like deforestation, ocean acidification, biosphere integrity, which includes loss of species, bio geochemical flows, and novel entities, which includes the accumulation of things like microplastics and man-made chemicals in the environment. The temperature of the air and sea is increasing. We are reaching and passing tipping points, and we have exceeded six of nine planetary boundaries. And yet our an annual carbon dioxide emissions are still increasing. So this brings us to our first breakout room. We're gonna take five minutes and um, like you all to introduce yourself and then just spend a few minutes talking about um, how climate change has affected you personally. I asked this question as an introduction question for the NDSA Climate Watch Group, and I was really struck by the variety of answers because I think it's easy um, to kind of get hyper-focused on the things that threaten you personally, but when you discuss it with a larger group of people, you'll see the variety of different ways that it's affecting people, and it kind of underscores how widely impacting the change is. Um, so I will let the moderators take over for the first. Welcome back, everybody. So I had to inject a little humor here since this, this is a heavy topic. Um, Greg here has set out an ambitious plan to phase out his alcohol consumption within the next 28 years. Um, the joke here being that this is the way that we've tackled reducing our emissions where we continue to uh, release carbon and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, believing that we can phase it out eventually, all the while still damaging our own uh, planet's health. So the modern industrial world that is all you and I have ever known was founded on burning cheaply available fossil fuels. We can't stop burning them without also stopping the vast majority of our activities, which would crash our economy. Yet the more we burn them, the more carbon we release into the atmosphere. Climate change is not a problem that can be solved. It is part of a larger predicament caused by overshoot. A predicament has outcomes that can be managed, but there's no returning back to the pre-predicament state. And that brings us to chapter three, digital preservation and climate change. Digital preservation is a combination of policies, strategies, and actions that ensure access to digital content over time. Like many activities, digital preservation is most successful during times of organizational, financial, and political stability. During the last few decades in which this niche professional area has grown, the United States has experienced fairly consistent financial and political stability. 
By this, I mean we haven't had any wars fought on U.S. soil or economic depressions, basically no events that have had a long-lasting destabilizing effect. COVID was probably the most disruptive event in recent history, but our economy didn't crash and our cultural heritage institutions largely were not affected. Lastly, when we say we are going to preserve something, we're also saying that we are going to make an ongoing commitment to energy expenditure and resource extraction. In addition to the resources that are required for digital preservation, we should be aware of the waste it creates. An estimated 50 million tons of electronic waste or e-waste are produced globally each year. And according to the Wealth World Health Organization, only about 17% of it is recycled. This waste is hazardous and it pollutes the environment where it's disposed. Children are often involved in waste picking, picking and scavenging and also in recycling materials as their small hands give them an advantage in picking apart the smallest items. <clears throat> At its heart, digital preservation is a risk assessment. We evaluate what the likelihood of certain risks occurring is and then implement strategies to mitigate them. These are the commonly understood threats to digital, digital materials that we try to mitigate. And I'm going to be revisiting the slide in a minute. Um, so I'll run through the risk then. Actually, that's the next slide. Um, so I took the list common threats of digital preservation and mapped the effects of climate change to each one. This isn't necessarily exhaustive, but it provides a glimpse of potential future difficulties that we'll have in preserving. So natural disasters will be more frequent, more severe and concurrent. Network failures will happen. Um, According to one study, by 2035, 4,000 miles of coaxial internet cable will be surrounded or underneath water, and that includes 235 data centers. Um, and then the transcontinental cables that connect continents are also expected to have uh, more disruption. There'll be an increase of internal and external attacks due to conflict and political upheaval. Um, the decrease in funding for curation activities due to economic contraction will affect the um, potentialities of loss of context because there won't actually be um, the money to have folks in those metadata or descriptive roles. And then economic failure and disruption and loss of will both will be affected by a variety of different things. Loss of will is essentially loss of will to preserve um, where an organization or a person decides that they will not make the effort to preserve something any longer. Um, and basically what I, what this exercise really highlighted for me was that organizational failure is much more likely to occur than it has ever been in our relatively stable past past. Digital preservation requires resources and energy. So every five years when our storage warranty runs out, we move to a new storage system, thus incurring the need for more materials like plastic, aluminum, glass, ceramic, silicone, and rare earth elements. Digital materials also require energy for their storage creation, also known as embodied energy. Oil is transformed into plastic cases and cables. Dr drills dig into the earth to extract minerals and metals used to create the electronic elements. In general, resource extraction takes place in the global south, and the raw materials are transported to China for production before the final products are delivered to the global north for use. Oil is needed to fuel the ships transporting these materials around the globe, and also to transport the manufactured goods to and from shipping docks. Industrial energy consumption is largely powered by fossil fuels and accounts for about 25% 25, 25 of all carbon dioxide emissions. Operating digital storage also requires energy, sometimes a lot of it. The cloud now has a greater carbon footprint than the airline industry. A single data center can consume the equivalent electricity of 50,000 homes. And that is before this, these uh, data points were taken before um, Chat GPT was released. So that brings us to chapter four, moving forward. So it seems that most of the focus in our field has been on mitigation or reducing the carbon footprint of our organizations and that adaptation is less studied. Adaptation is living with the warming that we already have. It's also possible to maladapt or fail to adjust appropriately to the situation. An example of this is when as a result of 
incoming migrants or other destabilizing factors, a right-wing strongman is voted into a position of power, and he then deconstructs renewable energy program programs. The population is left with an increased dependency on fossil fuels, and more gr greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a very long time. Given that we have not yet slowed our greenhouse gas emissions, we need to learn how to adapt or live with the warming that we already have. Mitigation is ultimately about continuing the fallacy that business can go on as usual, so long as we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions or switch to renewable energy technologies. And business as usual is linear thinking that doesn't also account for the other planetary boundaries that we've crossed. Adaptation is actually changing how we live in accordance with reality. Reducing our energy dependency is ultimately adaptive in a future where less energy is available. Thus, when you focus on adaptation rather than solely mitigation, you can both decrease your energy dependency and figure out how to live with the warming that is already baked in. The difficult thing about adaptation, however, is that it does require change. When I first started thinking about climate change and digital preservation, I did come up with a list of things that we can do to help preserve our digital materials, even in the face of climate change. But I'm not gonna repeat that list here because continuing on with business as usual is not the conversation I think we should be having. And I'm not sure that my own proposed solutions aren't doing just that. We look at the present through a rear view mirror. We march backwards into the future. We project the past onto the future, meaning that we expect the future to look like the past. The last time it was this hot was approximately 120,000 years ago. Our lifestyles and way of constructing society has created an existential crisis. How can we adapt in a way that will not make matters worse? Throughout this presentation, I've touched on a variety of different subject areas that one normally doesn't think of as related to digital curation. The intention was to put what we do in a larger context and illustrate its relationships to the world. This is what systems thinking does. We have been trained to think in a linear fashion, X cause Y to happen. If I stop X, then Y will stop. In contrast, system thinking, systems thinking requires examining how things relate, taking a wider perspective, and looking for root causes and improvements. When related to climate change, the question becomes, how do natural systems and social systems work together? System thinking and the acknowledgement of the myths that I mentioned earlier are evident in these foundational principles of the Planetary Limits Academic Network or PLAN. Although this group doesn't appear to be very active, um, they are a group of university professors who are aiming to raise awareness about critical systemic cha challenges facing the human endeavor by building a network of scholars across disciplines. And I'm going to read just a few of the uh, highlights from their foundational principles. Humans are a part of nature, not apart from nature. Non-renewable materials cannot be harvested indefinitely on a finite planet. Energy throughput is essential to all human activities, including the economy. Exponential growth, whether of physical or economic form, must eventually cease. Today's choices can simultaneously create problems for and deprive resources from future generations. Apparent success for a few generations during a massive drawdown of finite resources says a little bit little about our chances for long-term success. Are we really saving for future generations? Because that, that's the question I ask now, like who are we preserving for? Are we saving for future generations? Are they really gonna benefit from some obscure information saved off a floppy disk? Or are they gonna look back at us and say, why the hell did you waste so much energy on those activities? It's time for us to come to terms with the fact that we are preserving for the short term, the immediate. We are prioritizing things that we think researchers need based on what we know now, rather than trying to project into the future and seeing what will be helpful then. In a class action suit brought against the Minister of Environment of high school, um, by high school students in Australia, Judge Bromberg issued the following statement. The physical environment will be harsher, far more extreme and devastatingly brutal when angry. Lives will be cut short. Trauma will be far more common and good health harder to hold and maintain. This will largely be inflicted by the inaction of this generation of adults and what might fairly be described as the greatest intergenerational injustice ever inflicted by one generation of humans upon the next. This is the survivor library or how to survive, how to survive when the technology doesn't. 
It's a compendium of scanned public domain books that are predominantly on how to do the things that we've forgotten, how to set up and manage a farm, blacksmithing, sanitation, medical care, everything you may need to know if you have to rebuild after collapse. What's interesting to me is that this person, the librarian as they call themselves, has thought really deeply about what knowledge is necessary to build a community from scratch. The site even discusses a rudimentary preservation plan for these materials, which in involves copying them to thumb drives and keeping them in multiple places. If we are facing a drastically different world, like the one Judge Bromberg painted such a clear picture of, why isn't preserving this type of material what we're thinking and talking about? We can't predict the future, and I'm not trying to argue that we can, but our traditional planning methods do require some estimate of the future. You predict what will happen and then act. In areas of deep uncertainty where there's no agreement or certainty on the likelihood of occurrence of future events, you need different planning tools. The methods offered in the Decision Making Under Deep Uncertainty Toolkit take that approach of creating a plan and then iteratively testing that plan against a number of potential futures or scenarios. What does it look like if we start mapping out plausible future scenarios for our profession? We also don't necessarily have to imagine a whole new future. The global south already operates in a realm where less energy is used and less energy is available. What can we learn from them about what our future looks like and how we can adapt our preservation practices? Professor Jim Bendel published an influential and somewhat controversial article named Deep Adaptation in 2018 describing the conclusions he had come to concerning the climate predicament. At the end of the article, he offers four questions to help guide our inquiry into what kind of adaptation may be appropriate for our lives. And I think we can extend these questions to our profession as well. They are resilience. What do we most value that we wanna keep and how? Relinquishment, what do we need to let go of so as not to make matters worse? Restoration, what could we bring back to help us with these difficult times? and reconciliation. With what and whom shall we make peace as we awaken to our mutual mortality? So we're gonna go into our second breakout room now. And given the time constraints, we'll only address the first two questions. Um, please make sure that everybody in your group has a chance to speak. We have about eight minutes for this breakout room. So that should be a- Welcome back everybody. I hope those questions were uh, thought provoking and you had good to a good discussion in your breakout rooms. Maud Afzal in his book, Teaching at Twilight, lists a series of recommended, recommended steps for what we can do now that we understand the predicament that we're in. His audience is college professors, but I think these recommendations are just as relevant for you all. We already touched on learning to think in systems. Developing a solid understanding means to take this information and see how it relates to your life, your profession, and all of the Im implications therein. I have included a pretty big list of resources at the end of this presentation, and I, I advise you to delve into them. And then after delving into them, accepting the situation. This is difficult as the myth of progress is deeply ingrained in our society. A crucial part of acceptance is grieving. Grieving is an ongoing process. It's not easy to witness the destruction of the earth and not mourn for it. Afzal actually recommends integrating the process of mourning in our pedagogy, recognizing the importance of communal grieving and the need to process negative emotions so that our corresponding actions are not based out of fear or unprocessed trauma. Breaking the taboo means that we need to start talking openly about what lies ahead of us and normalizing it. The more normalized it becomes, the more we can take adaptive action. And with that comes the necessity to deconstruct solutioneering, which means identifying plans or solutions that hold the fake promise of continuing business as usual. Our society is incredibly optimistic, sometimes toxically so, and that optimism can lead to what appears to be easy answers. Banning straws may be easy, but holding businesses accountable for the pollution they create is not. And then lastly, remember overshoot. Our predicament is because we, and by we, I mean the global north, are using too much of the planet's resources. The era of cheap energies provided by fossil fuels is ending. Not only do we face less availability of the energy sources which started our industrialized society, but we also face the consequences of burning them in the form of global warming and climate change. 
myths of human superiority over the natural world and the continual, advance, continual advancement of progress has have driven us riding on the backs of our energy slaves to an existential precipice. The lives of future generations are going to be dramatically different than ours. As we engage with preser preservation activities, we need to be asking, who are we really preserving for? We can start to build out scenarios of potential futures, and we can str stress test those scenarios, preservation plans based on those scenarios. But we need to balance this work with a system's view based in the reality of our predicament. We have the potential to save critical information needed by future generations, but we also have the responsibility to make sure that we are not perpetuating harm. Thank you. And I do have, as promised, um, several slides with uh, further readings, and I will make these available um, through the Bit Curator crew.